Mike Venerable, and I'm the CEO of Sensi Tech. I'm from the southern shores of Ohio. Traveled all the way up here this morning to the northern shores. A uh, nice lake. Seen, I've now been to Cleveland almost 10 times in my life, and I've lived in Ohio almost all my life. So it's great. I wanted to, I wanted to really first just say one thing. This was the first time this event has been put on. It's a great idea, a fantastic idea. And I just want to thank the Jumpstart people for doing a great job of doing this on a very short notice and having an unbelievable number of attendees show up. This will be in Cincinnati next year, so I think you know they've set us extremely high bar, and it's a great, uh, a great event. So thanks everybody for coming. As part of this uh, process, as we volunteered to help in any way we could with uh, the first Venture Fest, um, we talked about we wanted to have something on the topic that haunts us all daily in our lives, artificial intelligence. And I would say that the most important thing, as we talked about it, as I said, I really want to get people who are dealing with this in, a lead, in an IT leadership level day to day, who have deep experience, have been in different situations and have seen the evolution of it. Because IT, you know, AI did not happen last November when ChatGPT was released. It's been around for a while. I had a conversation about AI with my 90-year-old mom recently, who told me about the time they got rid of the rate card people in an insurance company long before, you know, she was a key punch operator when she started. So this is not, this, this is really, we've been involved in computational decision making for a long time. But this is a step change. And my life has been defined by the integrated circuit. And if you're, you know, younger than me, which many of you are, almost all of you probably, your life will be designed, will really be defined by how artificial intelligence is going to be used. And you will live in a decade in a world that you do not recognize. You can't imagine. And I think that's the most interesting thing about it. So we, I asked and reached out when they asked, I said I'd help organize this panel. I reached out to Kirk Ball who's a friend, advisor of Sensi Tech, but who also has a deep, deep background and diversified background in IT. He was the former, when I met him, he was the CTO of Kroger. Kroger's a, you know, grocery's a hard industry. There's a lot of technology. You kind of walk in there, don't really realize it, but every day people run in and buy stuff and take it out and they have to fill it back up, count the money, get more of it. It's very complicated. And it's also a, a tight margin business. And I asked Kirk, who then was the CIO of a healthcare system in Cincinnati, and now, just recently, most recently was the CIO at Giant Eagle, another grocer. So I asked Kirk if he would help me put a panel together of his professionals, not where I or someone else would sit and ask them a bunch of questions, but where they could talk to one another and sort of question and have a conversation. So that's what I asked Kirk to do, so I'm going to turn it over to Kirk Ball. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks to Jumpstart Ventures for uh, having this panel get together. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to try and give you a little bit of insight into how corporations are thinking about artificial intelligence. Uh, I think we have more artificial intelligence that's being utilized today than what people might realize. Uh, certainly, Gen AI is something that people hear a lot about, uh, but there's many other facets to uh, artificial intelligence. Before we get started in our conversation, uh, I want to have Greg introduce himself, and then we'll ask Ryan to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Greg Simpson. I'm formerly the CTO and AI leader for Synchrony Financial. It was a spinoff of GE Capital. So I spent the last seven years of my career at Synchrony. Prior to that, I was with GE for about 30 years. I was my last job at GE before joining Synchrony was the CTO for all of GE, and I'd spent a lot of different jobs throughout GE. I want to give a shout out to Cleveland because I met my wife in Cleveland when I started at GE Lighting. And uh, my kids were born in Cleveland, and I got my master's at Case Western. So hey. And my master's, believe it or not, was in expert systems, one of the fields of AI back in the 80s, so a long time ago. So uh, Synchrony Financial is private label credit cards. Good news about that is we have lots and lots of data. And AI does great things when you have lots of data. So we can talk about some of those fun things. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Ryan Kane. So I'm the CIO at Total Quality Logistics. Uh, so for those that don't know Total Quality Logistics, uh, we are the largest full truckload freight broker in North America. Uh, last year, we ended the year just under $9 billion in sales. And in the supply chain industry, it is explosive. So I think three years before, we were about $3 billion. So you know, talk about the growth. And um, even though we're the largest full truckload broker, we have a single digit market share. So the upward potential and the uh, scope 
of opportunity that we have is pretty remarkable. So I've been at TQL for two years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 15 years at Kroger in a variety of technology, uh, data, strategy roles. Okay, and just a little bit about Giant Eagle, and then we'll get into our conversation. Giant Eagle is a uh, grocery, uh, pharmacy, convenience, and uh, fuel retailer uh, going from uh, Maryland over through Indiana, about $12 billion a year in sales. We serve about 4 million customers on a daily basis. Uh, so very, very uh, pleased to uh, work at Giant Eagle. It's a great company. Uh, but we all want to spend a little bit of time talking with you about how we think uh, in the roles that we serve in. How do we think about artificial intelligence? How do we educate people about artificial intelligence? How do we determine what aspects of artificial intelligence that we're going to try and inject into our organization? And where is artificial intelligence already being utilized? So, uh, Greg, I'm going to ask you, uh, and then Ryan and I will chime in, but when you talk about artificial intelligence, how would you describe artificial intelligence? Yeah, artificial intelligence is one of those big words. People use the word AI the way they use the word cloud. And so it represents a lot of different things. And I think one of the most important things you do when you set out an AI strategy is to break it out into something a little bit more realistic in terms of what you mean by that. So different companies can leverage different types of AI. In Synchrony, we had three pillars. We had machine learning, we had robotic process, uh, robotic process automation, and we had uh, intelligent virtual assistants. Now, since then, there's a fourth pillar. Everybody can probably guess what that is, generative AI. So those four pillars allowed us to then talk about, instead of just talking about this big buzzword, AI, we could talk about something more specific like machine learning. And the other thing we would do is we would then break that down into pragmatic What's a project or solution we want to implement in each of these pillars? So machine learning, for example, fraud was a big deal. Let's go after fraud. Let's, let's build a machine learning model for fraud. Uh, and, and I'll talk about that more in detail later. But so to me, AI isn't the word you want to define. You want to break it down and then define the other types of AI and figure out which ones work at your company. Because if you, if you work on AI, you're not going to get anything done. You got to work at something very specific. If you want to work on generative AI, fine, we can talk about that. If you want to work on machine learning, okay, we can talk about that. But I think you need to go down a level and then go down another level to pragmatic projects and show deliveries because boards of directors want to see results, they want to see dollars, they want to see something actually impactful come out of those AI projects. So you need to narrow it down. Uh, one more comment before I, before I be quiet and overstay my welcome is I often talk about artificial intelligence as augmented intelligence particularly true with generative AI, where generative AI can make mistakes. But boy, if it could generate 10 PowerPoint slides for me to start with, and I can use those as a starting point instead of a blank slide, that can really accelerate that PowerPoint generation. I, I had to generate way too many PowerPoint slides in my career. And same thing with code. If you're a really smart coder, have it generate some code. You know, you can generate some modules. That really smart coder can knit those together. So augmented intelligence can really accelerate your productivity by using things like generative AI, so. Yeah, I think that's a really good recommendation is to really be able to put the discussion around artificial intelligence in a form that is digestible by those that you're working with in the organization. Folks that are not technologists and then basically being able to say, this is how you can apply, whether it's image recognition, uh, computer vision, natural language processing, machine learning, this is how we can apply uh, those capabilities to solve business problems. And when you do that, people start to really understand, okay, now I kind of start to understand that. Ryan, can you talk a little bit about within TQL, what's, what's the conversation, what are the conversations that you're having kind of across the organization, whether it's you know, with the board, the, the gentleman that owns the company, senior leadership, folks that work in the technology or folks that don't work in the technology, what are the conversations that you're having? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's really interesting right now. So uh, like Mike said, it didn't start in November, right? Um, but that is the thought process of the virtually uh, probably 90% of corporate leaders out there is that all this is new. Um, what it's actually allowed us to do is to start to have a different conversation than we would have had before. So. Had we gone and talked about artificial intelligence last September, October, 
and said, wow, we need to have all this great data and it's gonna help us do this and drive this much more revenue or this much um, you know, more productivity, at some point in there, we're probably gonna get some eyes starting to glaze over. But all of a sudden, you know, ChatGPT 3.5 came out and everybody starts reading about it and it is consumable. And so while you know, folks will say, wow, it's, it's great, or some other people say, wow, it's just hype, it doesn't matter. What it did for us is it allowed us to start having a different conversation. It allowed us to start talking about business problems in a different way. When we go in to have a conversation about those business problems, do we talk about regression, or do we talk about clustering, or neural networks? Absolutely not, right? Because that's not the language of the people that are on the, the opposite side of the table. Now, will we t say chat GPT? Might we say generative AI? Probably. Why? Because it's consumable. Because everybody at this point understands at least the very simple part of what it is and that they can all go use it today. They don't understand you know, uh, machine learning. They don't understand you know, predictive regression models. That's, that's okay, just change the vernacular. And that's, that's what we've done as we've looked across all of our business problems and saying, okay, we know now we have this new tool in our toolbox and we have a new way of talking about all the tools in a way that is consumable uh, by the folks in, in the end that really have to get behind whatever it is we're trying to do and the business value we're trying to deliver. Yeah, and I think that's a really, for startups that are in the audience, I think that's a really good uh, piece of coaching. Uh, be mindful of the audience that you're talking to. If you're going in and you're talking to a business user, talking about the different branches of AI and neural nets and machine learning, they, they don't know what you're talking about. You have to go talk to them about what capabilities your product has within the context in which they are hearing you. And that context is the business role and the business challenges that that particular enterprise has. So be mindful of the audience. If you're talking to one of us uh, and, and we're, you know, well versed in some of the technologies, you should feel free and talk. We're gonna ask questions. Okay, well talk to us about what's under the cover. How does this work and why is your product, uh, why is it good? But be mindful of the audiences that you're talking to. It's all about the context of the audience you're speaking with that they come from. It's not about your context, it's about their context. And that's just something I think it's really important for you guys to uh, understand as you take your new products and your new capabilities, uh, which are spectacular to market. Um, Greg, talk a little bit, and I'm sure we'll kind of all chime in on this topic. I'd like for you guys to talk a little bit about some of the use cases uh, that you see AI being implemented in your organizations, and I'm sure we'll kind of all come up with a couple of examples. So, Greg, why don't you start with? Sure, sure. So, I'll give an example of machine learning to start. Um, you know, Synchrony is a private label credit card company. We have many years worth of transactions, historical transactions. We know that a number of those transactions were fraudulent. So we can take that historical transaction data, which is very extensive, more so than a typical uh, credit card, because you know if you do use a private label credit card, we know not that you just bought $10 worth of clothing. We know that you bought $10 in the men's clothing department, maybe a blue suit, maybe we know in much more detail. And we know things like the email address of the person, how long they've had it, so there's all sorts of data. And prior to this, you know, fraud models were built, were hand built by people to try to figure out what are all the variables that are gonna signal that this, this particular transaction is a fraud. With machine learning, we could feed it three years of history and say, here's three years of history. Here are the transactions that were fraudulent. Please, please build a model, basically a statistical model that predicts when a, when a transaction is gonna be fraudulent. And then we would take another couple years worth of data and, and test that model and say, Let's see how good it did. See if it picked out the transactions that we know were fraudulent or not. We saw a 9x improvement in our fraud model when we used machine learning. Nine times improvement. Fraud is a huge problem for, for banking industries and credit cards. Lots of money involved. A nine times improvement is a really big deal. That's just one example. Other examples, uh, intelligent virtual agents. If you go to Lowe's or if you go to... Uh, any of the other Synchrony branded sites, or actually they're not Synchrony branded, they're branded by their private label. If you go to any of the other private label Synchrony places, you can meet Sydney. Sydney's a virtual assistant that'll talk to you, help you get a credit card, help you understand what's going on. She'll answer your questions. She's a chat bot, 
right? Built prior to ChatGPT. So she's a little less intelligent in some ways than ChatGPT, but she's much more accurate because she's very specifically programmed to return things that are pertinent to credit cards and to your processing. Um, another, another use case. So when we, when we established our three principles, we set out and said we want to do something big in machine learning, so we went after fraud. We want to, we want to do something intelligent, in intelligent virtual agents, so we went and did Sydney. And we want to do something with robotic process automation where we did a lot of automation in our back room. And then you could go to the board and demonstrate real dollar savings. So I ran the technology committee for the board, met with them quarterly, and they were very interested. The good news is they were very interested in technology. And now, as, as Ryan said, with, jet, with you know, generative AI, people are even more interested. Hey, let's talk even more about this stuff. So it's a great chance to really um, educate, but you have to have pertinent business examples to really educate effectively. Ryan? Yeah, I think uh, it really gets into, you know, the, the application and different uh, type of AI you use, you know, gets into that business problem you're trying to solve. And then uh, to Greg's point around, you know, the augmented intelligence uh, being part of this as well. So I'll kind of step through that. So from an overall, where is it being used? And the use cases, a lot, you know, predictive models is a very similar story, but uh, forecasting, right? The supply chain industry is extremely, um, I would say, predictably unpredictable, right? So overall, there's, there's tightening and loosening within the supply chain market. Then you throw in um, a global pandemic and everything gets kind of thrown upside down. So being able to understand previous data, how that you know, aligns into future predictability, and then kind of taking what would probably be termed a black swan event at the time, and you know, putting that you know, as much as you can into the model to understand, okay, what does this mean for your business? You know, for us, that would mean, what does it mean for your consumers or your customers that are needing to ship product? What does it mean for all the people on the other side? So we're more of like a two-way marketplace. We need to go find carriers for all that product. What does it mean when all of a sudden half the carriers aren't there anymore, right? Because they're not able to drive or they're not able to move product and being able to bring that back into to those models. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of underneath of the, a little bit behind the scenes use case around AI. And then you get kind of more into the, you know, what's in front of people. Um, how do we have our, uh, AI built into our RPA? So that as we look at all of our process, automation opportunities, how do we take s small steps out of every process we can through automation? That's more you know, in, the, in the front, and people can see that uh, every day, and it makes our lives a little bit easier. And now as we start to introduce more on the gen AI side, and this is where I think it gets into the, um, a lot of coaching in terms of, yeah, this is augmented, this is not your brain, right? This is a start. Um, but letting people understand that whatever it comes out, it's not you know, coming out of this you know, magical black box that you should implicitly trust. You know, if you went out you know, in the wild and just started shouting things into the woods and answers came back, would you just trust that? That's what we do, right? And so it's trying to coach people to say like, yeah, it's, it's cool, it's slick, there's a, a lot of big words that come out and a lot of them seem like they're probably right, but you have to understand that it is not your brain. It may be like a 70% start, but you still have work to do. Um, so augmenting um, that work. So for us, it really is we look at where do we, where are those use cases, and then what do we apply to each one? We kind of step through that. You know, what's really behind the scenes? What's kind of in that middle layer that's used every day, but maybe not right kind of at the forefront? And then what is visible and part of the user experience, uh, whether it be a customer, a carrier, or an associate? So uh, by show of hands, who here periodically shops at a grocery store, whether it be virtually or physically? Okay, so just about everybody. <laughs> the number one frustration that customers feel is product being out of stock. So whether you're physically, you're doing an analog experience and you're in a store and you go to a shelf to buy a product and it's not there, or whether or not you put that product digitally into your cart and then you get a call from one of our folks that pick your order and go, we don't have that for you. Uh, what would you like to substitute, right? So a challenge for us is how do we either eliminate or significantly minimize the amount of time where there's a hole on shelf? And so we're heavily doing experimentation with computer vision and then machine learning 
to do uh, recognition of when there's not product on the shelf because at Giant Eagle and in many cases, grocery stores pick from shelves that the same uh, shelves customers pick from. So it serves two purposes. So we are using an, an computer vision and machine learning to identify when a product is off a shelf and then notifying what product is the product in store? Do we have it in inventory and back stock? And how do we then send notification to a team member in store so that we can get that product, that hole filled, and instead of paying uh, team members to walk around with a gun and shoot a hole uh, and to see if then there's inventory, we want our team members giving concierge-like service to our customers. So things that we can automate using artificial intelligence capability uh, so that we can free up our team members' time to give concierge service to customers and decrease the amount of time we have an out of stock, it's incredibly impactful. So that's a use case for us. And then another one I'll give is we uh, do a ton of price and promotion planning. So really taking and looking at all of our stores, our customer segments, and understanding what type of product, what type of price point on a given product, what type of a promotion actually moves the needle and speaks to our customers that shop in that store. There's a ton of machine learning that goes into that price and promotion planning. And then that price and promotion recommendation on items in particular stores then gets sent down to the point of sale. And in a given store, we may have a product A uh, that has a particular price point and a particular promotion. In store number two, we may have <clears throat> that same product that has a different price or a different promotion because that's what the customers unique to that location want to see. And so that's another way. And when you start to explain to your leader, in our case, when we started to explain to our leadership, hey, guess what? We're already using artificial intelligence, right? We're using these different branches, and this is what we're using artificial intelligence to solve. They understood the business problems. That's a context that they can relate to. So it was really, really impactful for them to uh, hear those use cases. The last use case I wanna talk about is a generative AI use case. And for anybody that's thinking about using generative AI, I'll put a plug in here for a company I know of. Uh, it's called Writer. Uh, they have a magnificent uh, generative AI platform. And we right now are doing uh, workshops with Writer um, at uh, Giant Eagle, specifically applied to our uh, marketing campaigns. So a marketing campaign can be a lot of work and can take a long time. We want to run more marketing campaigns. We want the volume and the velocity to improve and the amount of time it takes to get a marketing campaign done. We have marketing campaigns that can take up to 10 weeks to generate. We believe in some of our initial uh, workshops with Writer, we can take that down to eight to 10 days. Now you start to think about the different promotions, the more personalized promotions, the more regionally impactful promotions that you can do because now you have a volume and a velocity that's very, very impactful for taking your uh, goods and services to market. So that's an example of how we're looking to use generative AI. Kurt, I've got another generative AI example. Uh, I was working with a nonprofit recently called Trauma Free World, and they wanted to figure out how to provide a chat bot for parents caring with, for children that have experienced trauma. And there are a number of specific routines to help you deal with different incidences. And, you know, they typically had done video training, but they had, you know, a parent in the middle of the night has a big problem, they're trying to figure out how to deal with this child. You know, it, they couldn't just call somebody. So uh, they, they used chat, generative AI to develop a chat bot using very specific content around how to deal with trauma-informed care for children so that those parents or any caretaker could quickly go out and ask a question and get some advice, get some protocols, get some ways to deal with different situations. Very, very powerful. And the other thing they recognized was, even if they had called a hotline, the person answering it doesn't necessarily know the right answer either, right? So uh, the humans weren't 100% effective. So the chat GPT may not be 100% effective either, but it's that one of the interesting things is Stanford's AI 2023 report shows that uh, AI has now achieved a point where it's better at uh, some types of reasoning 
than humans, uh, which is something it's had a challenge doing for a long, long time. So some really interesting applications coming out of the new technology that's being deployed. Kirk, I want to go back to your, um, your grocery example with out of stocks. And I think this is a great example of when you look at how does AI fit into the entire customer experience, there's so many solutions, there's so many startups that we see every day that are a point, in, like a point of a particular niche of a problem. Here is an example where looking at the entire system of the customer experience, you know, the issue out of stocks. Um, now, if you go into a grocery store and there's an out of stock and you say, you know, I want uh, Del Monte, you know, pineapple, and you reach for it, and there's an out of stock there. What do you do? You move your hand over here, and you grab Dole, right? You still go, you still go home with pineapple. And that may happen what, a dozen times while you're shopping, and you don't even realize it. Now, if you go online, and you order your online groceries, and you go to the store to pick them up, and somebody comes out to you, and they say, hey, Mr. Ball, thank you for shopping with us today. There were 12 items where we were out of stock, and you know we didn't have substitutes. Well, that's, a, that's not a great experience, right? All of a sudden, you're like, wow, what just happened? You, you couldn't satisfy my need, right? My experience is not good. Same experience I would have had had I gone in the store, but the presentation is different. Now, okay, now we bring AI into this. And we're doing, you're looking, um, you know, through video, doing image recognition, identifying holes on the shelf, either addressing those, or now all of a sudden you can update your balance on hand and actually take those products off the website for that store, and now, you know, the person in the store never has an impact, and then the person working or uh, shopping online, their experience goes up, even though they don't know it. They're, they're, you know, they don't think their experience has changed, but the end result, the overall system it has improved, just because you're using the AI to look at the entire um, opportunity there. Yeah, one last thing I'll talk about, and then we'll move to our next topical area, is uh, I, I'm, very much looking forward to the, day, to the day when we have augmented reality in grocery stores. Imagine if you have a shopping list, you're going into a store, and inanimate objects, objects start to animate themselves. And so we know when you happen to be in store by the MAC address on your cell phone, you sign up to be part of our program, and we have access to your digital grocery list that you've created. And then you start going through the store and the store starts to help you ensure one, that you've got everything that you've got on your list. You um, understand where that product was sourced. There's additional information. You can identify things that you've bought in the past but may not have on your list. They're now on promotion, right? And I think there's such opportunity uh, to really create such a cool experience uh, once, you, once we can get the augmented reality. And for me, the big unlock is not having to walk around with your cell phone up like this. Uh, it's, it's having something that's hands-free. But I do think uh, those artificial intelligence capabilities, those six or seven that we mentioned, in combination can help create that augmented reality uh, capability. And I think it's going to create a, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. So in your organizations, Greg, that you worked in and are still in contact with, and Ryan, the organization that you work in, who has responsibility for governing, governing the application and utilization of AI? How are you guys managing that governance? Well, in financial services, we had an entire risk organization dedicated to really watching for certain risks and making sure that the functions that were implementing the technologies were adhering to regulatory concerns and, and other risks. And uh, because, you know, the technology organization, in my opinion, has to be out there making it happen, pushing the envelope, figuring out how to help the business move forward. Uh, and so we had a, a risk organization that we would partner with that would try to, you know, keep us in line with the regulators and so on. So it was a very, very specific organization in the case of financial services. Yeah, for us, um, not quite the same uh, regulatory requirement that, that Greg has experienced in the past. Uh, we've developed a, a COE model where we'll have uh, heavy uh, influence from our data, analytics, security, and then representation from our legal team as well. And so as we have opportunities that come in outside of, I'd say, known patterns. So this is like, okay, we're gonna try to do something a little bit more novel with a particular technology, then we'll run it through uh, that group, understand is there a business value there? How would we 
develop it? Uh, does it fall in line? Can we trust the data that's coming back, the answers that are coming back? And then ultimately, how do we operate it, right? So in the end, someone has to maintain it going forward. And so we want to make sure we have that identified up front as well. And so this COE structure, we're finding success with it. Uh, I would say we're still, still finding our footing a little bit with it and refining as we go. So uh, here's a brief interlude. Here's the good news for you. We understand that we are the only thing sitting between you and cocktails. Uh, so we are going to be on time. Uh, we've got 43 more bullets. Uh, I promise we'll get you out on time. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the next topic because this one is really interesting to me. And I'll tell you a funny, an a funny anecdote, um, how I was trying to educate um, the CEO, uh, I made the mistake of sending him a Lex Friedman podcast uh, on AI, and that can get pretty esoteric. So he kind of looked at me like I was the first person that just landed on Earth from Mars. Um, so I had to back up and I had to start speaking and talking from the context in which he came from. Uh, but what's the role of technology uh, in the organization educating the organization, the various aspects of the organization from the board to individual contributors to folks that might work in a store or folks that work in a, a distribution terminal. Uh, what's the role from your guys' perspective uh, that technology has? One of the things that we had a lot of success was with partnering with universities. So we opened an emerging technology center at the University of Illinois because we had a data engineering center of excellence in Chicago. And a lot of people that went to the University of Illinois wanted to live in Chicago when they graduated. So it was a great way to get students at really low cost to work on emerging technologies and then provide a pipeline into jobs at our data center of excellence in Chicago. Um, so very successful, lots of ways to sort of get new ideas. And then to educate, we could bring executives to that center at the University of Illinois, have these highly energetic students talking about these great new things, showing them around. Uh, we had access to the supercomputing center there at the U University of Illinois. Um, so you could do, you know, sort of kill two birds with one stone. You're educating your executives. You're also building a pipeline for new talent. You're, you're looking at new emerging technologies that maybe you couldn't afford to spend a lot of time on unless you found a lower cost opportunity and students unfortunately are lower cost and when, before they graduate than they are after they graduate. So we have uh, we have a cadre of uh, five uh, postgraduate uh, going for their PhD students from Carnegie Mellon right now that are doing um, an artificial artificial intelligence machine learning based uh, set of work for us right now at Giant Eagle. Yeah, yeah. So really great opportunity. So working with universities is something I'd encourage every company to do. But I think, you know, you do have a responsibility in educating all the way from the top down. You know, so I mentioned the, the technology committee, the board. The board's really interested. You've just got to be able to talk in their language so that they can understand what you're talking about. One of the exciting points of my career was when, after spending a lot of time with the CEO and her staff, uh, educating them about our our cloud strategy and our API strategy and our AI strategy and our data lake strategy and how we were going to do, use APIs to connect Venmo and to synchronize financial services. Uh, you know, she she got up at a meeting of the top 35 companies, top 35 people at the, at the organization and said, you all need to know what an API is because this is key to winning the PayPals and the Venmos of the world. And uh, so suddenly, at the top people in our company really wanted to understand a little bit deeper than they ever did before how technology worked because they understood this was a game changer for our company and we won the Venmo account. Uh, so if you have a Venmo credit card, it's a synchrony card. But uh, so I, th I think education is really important. But, you know, I think we said earlier, both of you said earlier, you've got to do it at the level that's appropriate for your audience. Um, and you've got to think of creative ways to do it. Like students, it's not always you. It's sometimes it's bringing other people in to do that education. Yeah, I mean, uh, not, not to reiterate the education point, I think it, it goes across the organization depending on what role it is. So kind of pulling in product management is part of that too. It's educating your business users so they understand what are the new opportunities that are potentially out there. There's so many um, folks right now, they're coming from a point of, uh, say, curiosity, but ignorance. Right? So they want to learn, but they just don't know, and they need somebody to help them ask a new question. If you do the exact same thing for five straight years, and someone comes in tomorrow and says, hey, how can we do this better? It's going to be, well, this is what I do, right? So it's part of that education is getting out there and helping them 
start helping them ask a new question. Another big part I think technology plays is reaching out into uh, the network, the community, whether that's through existing partners, new partners, new startups, and understand where is the technology going, where is the money flowing, and trying to get ahead of that and say, okay, well, how does that play into our future business strategy um, as well? So, you know, definitely uh, multiple layers of, you know, where technology plays in this. And ultimately, it's, it's not going to be successful in the organization long term um, without a, a heavy, I think, technology footprint. Yeah, I would also put a little bit of the burden for education back on the VCs and back on startups. Uh, you have to understand the position that we are in. We are trying to um, assess what technologies are out there to help us solve business problems. At the same time, we don't control the money, right? So we have to be able to explain the value proposition that your products, uh, where you're investing your money, uh, is going to add value to the business problems that are business leaders focus on day in and day out. So sometimes that slows down the cycle. This uh, need to educate the value proposition of what you're creating and what you've created or what you're investing in and its applicability to the value proposition that we're trying to deliver to shareholders, I think you have some accountability to help us uh, figure out the best way to educate and the best way to uh, really tell the story uh, from a business perspective about the products you've created or where you're investing your money. I think it's very, very important. This education piece cannot be over or underestimated. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what are the skills and competency that are required to, uh, in the org to utilize. Let's say you get money um, and now you've got uh, some folks that may be skilled in some of the aspects of artificial intelligence, uh, but you may not have a complete team. You may not have a team that's uh, you know, incredibly mature in training a large language model to advance your generative AI capabilities. What are, the, what are those kind of skill sets that you think are really, really important for uh, not only implementing with third-party assistance, with the startup's assistance, but then being able to manage and maintain? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a myriad of data roles, data skills, and I'm not saying these are individual people, but skills from a, you know, engineering, analytics, visualization, um, product management, understanding what it is the problem you're trying to solve and what is the market fit you're trying to go after, and then how do you measure outcomes at the end? Um, because in, in the end, you ultimately are probably going to be trying to get additional funding uh, for whatever that good idea may, may be. Um, I, I think of a skill or a set of skills that we typically overlook is we, we end up gravitating towards technical skills is the critical thinking, the systems thinking. Being able to decompose and recompose um, large systems and problems is a huge part of being able to be successful in AI and a whole bunch of other areas as well. Um, and then ultimately, uh, and we keep going back to this, you have to have somebody that can talk, right? Somebody that can actually carry, a, carry on a conversation uh, to whomever um, you know is, is sitting on the other side of that table, your constituent, uh, to help them understand the value that they're potentially going to get. So I want to jump on my soapbox real quick. One of the most important jobs or capabilities that CIOs or CTOs have to have is we have to be master storytellers. You have to be able to tell a story of why, how, uh, where, when, we have to be really good storytellers. Part of your responsibility is to help us to be good storytellers. Because without being a storyteller, we're not gonna get the funding, we're not gonna connect the dots for the people that control the funding. Uh, and look, the organization also has to get its head wrapped around organizational change management, right? What's the impact uh, to the jobs and to the roles and the responsibilities and the way that you conduct business as you implement some of these capabilities and technologies. I'll give you a really interesting example. I mentioned earlier that we brought Ryder in and I introduced Ryder to our marketing team and talking about um, the capability to create, increase the volume and velocity of our ability to create marketing campaigns. Uh, when I first did the introduction though, you could feel the trepidation uh, with the folks that are in the marketing group how's this gonna work? Is this thing gonna do everything for us? 
And once we had the conversation that said, no, you have to paint the context for the generative AI engine that is writer. You're gonna have final approval. It's just gonna allow you to have more things going on simultaneously. And then, wow, you can do that? We can move at this pace? That's fantastic. So we had to learn how to be a storyteller to manage the expectations of that team to help them understand, no, you're still gonna be engaged, right? Uh, it's just the fact that you now have a super duper assistant that's gonna be, help, help, be able to help you move at a volume of velocity that you've never been able to move at before. Um, I, I took that to a whole new level when I retired and I wrote a book called The Quantum Contingent. It's a spy novel. And so, you know, the storytelling comes out even after you retire and say, oh, what, what, you know, there's a lot of spies, use a lot of technology, why not? So. That was awesome, the way you worked that in. <laughs> Give me something on that. That was perfect. It, is, it actually is a really interesting thesis. Um, we talked about this a little bit. We had another bullet talking about third parties. Education institutions, vendors, consultants, all uh, third parties that can be very beneficial in helping you tell a story. Uh, I want to switch now. Let's talk about the risks. So you mentioned uh, the risk management function. We too are governing AI, including risk folks. What are the risks that you guys uh, are trying to manage with the implementation and utilization of the various aspects of AI? My, my view is one of the biggest risks is not using it, right? So, so being paralyzed by the fear of AI and not moving fast enough and then allowing your competition to embrace it and find ways to leverage it to be more productive than you, to move faster than you, to be more nimble than you, to deliver new capabilities for the customers that you didn't do because you didn't embrace it. So I think one of our biggest risks is that fear of, wait, which is why education is so important. There are ways you can do this safely. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have risks. I did a TED talk on AI and risks and you know, I use the analogy of the, of the automobile when it first came out. It didn't have seatbelts until the first crash. And then they said, yeah, maybe we ought to strap people into these things. So we do need to have safe, we need, we need our seatbelts for AI. We need to be safe. But it doesn't mean we don't want to do cars. It doesn't mean we don't want to do AI. We just need to do it in a safe fashion. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, you, you have the same risks um, that we all hear about as, as it relates to gen AI and and bias and hallucinations and you know there's a there's a ton to read about on that then there's the ai on you know we talk about regression models and clustering you own the data there you own the control you own the model so the management of that risk is a different level where you have greater control i 100 percent agree with greg that the biggest risk is not getting on board and understanding where can this take you it is it's the difference between a company being on an exponential growth curve and a linear growth curve Right? So it isn't the conversations we have, it is not that you're falling behind one to one. It's you're falling behind one to one today, three to one tomorrow, seven to one on Friday, right? So that's the risk that companies have is that they don't get there fast enough or they wait to try to figure out how can we be a laggard within this and still gain benefit. That will drive complacency in market and, and loss of share. Overall, I think a lot of companies will find a slow death. Yeah, some of the big banks have put hardware in their data centers already specifically to run open source models to do generative AI so that they own the model, nobody else has the data, they can use their data. So there are ways to do it securely, um, but you need to, you know, you need to be, pay attention because it's changing really, really fast. I want to add one last comment before we wrap up. I would encourage you as founders of companies, as venture capital firms, as private equity firms, Establish a deep partnership with operators that live in the real world every single day. Not that you didn't or you don't, but I think the collaboration between those entities can be very, very powerful. Sometimes we see things that you don't see. Uh, I am so encouraged uh, by the creativity, the ingenuity that I see from startup companies, uh, companies that are in Series A, Series B. It's absolutely an awesome place to be. I admire what you do. But just remember, establish deeper collaboration with those that also are in the operating world. They will help you advance the pace and the capability of your solutions 
maybe well beyond what you can, what you think about if you're not uh, connected up with folks in the operating world. But my hat's off to you. Uh, and I think our time has come to an end. Thank you. Thanks.